And a very pleasant good day to each and every one of you. I'm Brother James, and I greet you one more time in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We are studying this incredible book of the, of the Bible, Revelation. And the book of Revelation has occupied us for 17 lessons now. We are on lesson 18, and we have made it all the way to chapter 1 and verse 17. In Revelation 1.17, John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos in the Spirit on the Lord's Day has seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. The description of the person of the Son of God, the Son of Man, is given to us in verses 13 through 16. And verse 17 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. John, in verse 10, says, I heard. John, in verse 12, says, I turned. John in verses 12 and 17 says, I saw. And John in verse 17 says, I fell. What a wonderful picture we have here of how the Lord saves a sinner. John is not getting saved here. John is actually seeing Jesus Christ and Jesus is going to give him to him the revelation of uh, how things will turn out in the end. But we have a picture here of God saving the sinner. First, the voice. And we know the voice to be the Lord. And John said in verse 10, I heard, I heard. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the first step in this matter of being saved is you have to hear the voice of the Lord. You have to hear the word of God. Second, he did not continue in his own ways, but he turned to the source of the words. This is a marvelous picture of repentance. I, I know people argue about repentance. Do you have to repent? Do you not have to repent? How do you repent? What does repentance mean? We, we're not arguing that. Not, not now, not now. Jesus taught repentance. John the Baptist taught repentance. Paul taught repentance. Peter, James, and John taught repentance. The New Testament from, from start to finish, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, he didn't command everyone everywhere to shed a lot of tears. He didn't command everyone everywhere to have an emotional experience. He didn't command everyone everywhere to stop doing every wrong thing they were doing. But he did require everyone that believed the wrong thing to abandon that belief and believe the right thing. He did demand that everyone that was on the way to hell change direction. And so John, John said, I turned, I turned. Such turning is despised by those more concerned with soul winning, not a Bible term, certainly not a New Testament term, uh, than God saving souls. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The testimony of those in Thessalonica was that they, well, let's read it here at chapter 1, they turned to God from idols. They turned to God from idols. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I believe it's verse number 8. Is it here? 8, 7... Um, here we go, nine, there it is, nine. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The prodigal son did not stay in the pig pen. After he said he had sinned, he got out of the pig pen and headed for home. So John heard the word. He turned, changed direction. Verse number three, he did not behold, or, or the third point, he did not behold the Lord until he heard the word and turned. But when he heard the word, turned in response to the word, he then said, I saw. And when he saw, oh, once he came face to face with the resurrected Christ, he falls as a dead man. No argument, 
no opinion, no hope of impressing with his works. He fell at his feet as dead, dead in trespasses and sins, hoping to be raised in newness of life. And, and this is the way of genuine conversion. Hear, turn, see, fall. Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken. Oh, but the broken one will be lifted up by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this verse, we read that while in his fallen position, not a fall into sin, but a fall into, into a uh, humble worship, the Lord laid his hand upon John. Look at this, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me. What a blessing. We do not read. Now, now we're back to the literal words of the text. We do not read that John was elevated or told to stand. As far as the text records, as far as what the Bible says, <coughs> John's position does not change until he is caught up to the throne. He says in Luke 1, 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand upon me. So John's on the ground at the feet of Jesus. Jesus puts his hand upon John, and the next change in position we read about is in chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. So just in the, in the wording of the passage, John falls at the feet of Jesus. The revelation of the seven churches unfolds before him. And John does not change position until he is taken up to heaven in response to a call to come up hither. How different would our lives be if we spent those days between our first beholding the glory of the risen Christ and our departure to be with him, bowed humbly in his presence with his hands upon us and his word revealing to us the truth. Think about that. How different would be the history of the New Testament church had all the saved people who humbled themselves at the feet of Jesus in order to be saved, had they just stayed in that same humble, contrite condition of heart, of mind, of spirit, of attitude, right up until the day that he called them home. He says to John, fear not. I always like uh, this use of uh, th this phrase as Jesus uses it because he so frequently says fear not in a time when someone would be expected to be just as terrified as one could be. When the uh, disciples were hiding in the upper room after his resurrection, the Bible says that Jesus just, just came right through the wall and stood in the midst. The door was locked and, and bolted and nobody opened the door and suddenly there was the Lord and, and he said, uh, fear not, peace, be still. Uh, when, when Jesus says that, he is asking the impossible except he's present and he can bring peace to the troubled heart. So he tells John, fear not, I am the first and the last. Christ says, in effect, before there was anything to fear, I am. And I will be here after all the things that you fear have passed away. Jesus Christ is greater than whatever would cause us alarm. Jesus Christ is greater than whatever we might, uh, might trouble our hearts. And before we see the evil and the uh, plagues and the judgments and the, the outpouring of wrath unfolded for us in this book of Revelation, we see their conqueror. We're going to read about creatures out of a bottomless pit. Fear not. 
we are going to read about apostate and erring churches. Fear not. We're going to read about a beast and his mark. Fear not. We're going to read about uh, poison waters and stars falling from the sky. Fear not. Remember, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of tribulation judgments. It's not the revelation of Satan's final attack. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he says to the revelator, he says to the one who is going to record these truths, let's start, let's start with this, don't be afraid. Oh, there's, there's lots in this book to be afraid of. But not if you're at the feet of Jesus Christ with his hand upon you and his words comforting your heart. He says, Here's why you should not fear. I am the first and the last. We covered this earlier. In verse 8, he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. We read that in Isaiah uh, 41 and verse number 4, Jehovah, God the Father, stating that all his life is the work of his power. In Isaiah 45, 6, the Creator boasting there's none beside him who can form light and darkness. We read in Isaiah 48, 12, and 13 that he uses the same title to illustrate his magnificence. Not only has he made the heavens and the earth, but he is so great to have formed them with his own hands. Thus, when the Lord Jesus Christ uses this title for himself, in Revelation 1, 11, in Revelation 1.17, and at the end in Revelation 22.13, only the most desperate opponents of the truth could deny that he is the very God who created all things. He says he is the first. He says he is the beginning. He says he is the alpha. I believe him. I hope you do too. He says that he is the last. He is the omega. He is the ending. Now, again, I, I, not, not to be repetitious, just to be repetitious, but, but to help you with this. When we get to Revelation chapter number 6, we get to Revelation 6, we have a, a series of seal, seals opened, and we got a white horse going forth, conquering and to conquer, and then we've got a, a red horse going forth with power to take peace from the earth, and and then we've got a, a black horse going forth, and and starvation and famine, and then we've got a a fourth horse going forth, and and death and hell sit upon this horse, and and they're going to kill with a sword and hunger and death and with beasts, and it's terrible. But it's not the last thing that's going to happen. It's frightening. But it's not the end. And oh, we read here in Revelation 7 that there's, uh, there's fire and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake and, and fire mingled with blood and hail and the grass is burned up and fire cast into the sea and the sea creatures are dying and, and, and then the, 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 the moon and the stars and, uh, and the, the lights in heaven are going dark and it's... It's bad business, but it's not the end. It's not the end. And we read in Revelation 9 about this, this, these creatures coming that torment men and, and men wanting to die and not being able to die. And, and then we read about, uh, oh, just, it, it just goes on and on and on through chapter 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. And, and then rises this mother of harlots and, and the, the uh, economic system of the world is under the power and control of the devil. But that's not the Omega. And as we keep reading through this book of Revelation, here's what we find. The plagues come to an end, and the empire of the beast comes to an end, and the reign of mystery Babylon comes to an end, and the mercantile system of literal Babylon comes to an end, and Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, never comes to an end and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, where God dwells with his people and his people dwell with him, 
never comes to an end. And the Lamb, being the light of that city, never comes to an end. So before we start unfolding the things in Revelation that might make one afraid, we have the one who says, fear not. And before we begin to look at the horrible things that will happen on the earth, we have the Lord Jesus Christ telling John to tell you and telling John to tell me, it's not going to end with judgments. It's not going to end with wrath and fire and fury and plagues and death. It's going to end with me. Jesus Christ, the Alpha, Jesus Christ, the Omega, Jesus Christ, the beginning, and Jesus Christ, the ending. Praise the Lord. I'm the first and the last. He's the last Adam. He's the last subject, the last topic in the great book of God. Now, it says in verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And he is the only one who can make that claim, and behold, I am alive forevermore. There was a man raised from the dead, a boy raised from the dead by Elijah. He was dead, he lived, but death, the first death came for him a second time. There was a man when Elisha was buried and the corpse of Elisha touched the bones of this man and this man was raised to live again. He escaped the first death, but only temporarily. That man later died again. Jesus raised the widow of Nain's son. He raised Jairus' daughter. He raised Lazarus from the dead. We, we really don't know how many people throughout the course of his three and a half years of ministry. We really don't know how many people Jesus raised from the dead, but they were numerous. But none of them is on a speaking tour today so that you can shake their hand and have your picture made with them because they all died again. But when Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb three days and three nights after he laid down his life, you know, you know what he did? He took the time to change out of his grave clothes and fold them and leave them lying in that tomb, he didn't pack them and take them with him. He didn't carry them under his arm or, or put them in a, in a bag. He left them behind because he would never, never, never need them again. Not only is he alive, he is alive forevermore. Have you been to Jesus Christ and trusted him as your Savior? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that, who, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, have everlasting life. Jesus agreed with his Father, the Father agreed with the Son, that were Christ to die upon the cross to pay for our sins and rise from the dead, and he did, that the Father would give him the power, the authority, the right to give eternal life to all that came to him in faith. It's John 17. You can read it there. Jesus Christ doesn't have temporary life. So the life that he gives you when you believe on him is not temporary life. It is eternal life. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, this is what you need to take a look at. Behold, I am alive forevermore. And then we have another of those uh, amens that we find in Revelation. We had one in uh, verse number six and one in verse number seven, and here's one uh, again in verse number uh, 18. But this one is spoken by Jesus Christ. I, I, I am he, so be it. I live, so be it. I was dead, so be it. I am alive forevermore, so be it. Jesus Christ, all the promises of God in him are yea and amen. When he says, fear not, let it be so. 
When he says he's the first and the last, let it be so. When he says he lives and was dead, let it be so. When he says he's alive forevermore, let it be so. This is not another Jesus. This is not a different Jesus. The one that hung on that cross, he's right here. The one that was laid in that tomb, he's right here. The one who's speaking to John, same one, it's the same Jesus. He'll never die again. Praise his holy name. He says, I am alive forevermore. Do you have everlasting life? You can only get it one place, Jesus Christ. If I, if I say something in, in a forum that reaches the entire world, if I say something negative or critical about Muhammad, it could cause me great harm. If I said something critical about Buddha or Confucius, it, it would upset many, many people. If I said something negative or, or if I found fault with one of the, one of the popes, there'd be a lot of people say, whoa, wait a minute, that's, that's out of bounds. So let me just say this. Whatever you think of Muhammad, whatever you think of Confucius or Buddha or Joseph Smith or Judge Rutherford or popes or uh, Mother Teresa or just, just pick some grand leader of some grand religion, what, whatever you want to say about them, favorable or unfavorable, let me make this statement about Jesus Christ. He liveth though he was dead, and he is alive forevermore. Had we buried Moses and Elijah and John the Baptist and Confucius and Buddha and Muhammad and Joseph Smith and Mary Ellen White and Mary Baker Patterson Glover Eddy and, and John Wayne and the Pope and Mother Teresa, and Oral Roberts, and just, just if, if we took them all and buried them all in one graveyard, there would only be one tomb in that cemetery whose occupant had walked out of it alive under his own power and never gone back into the grave again. I am telling you that there are many religions in this world that may offer you the opportunity to live a better life. There are many religious leaders in the world who might have left behind teachings that would help you in some way or another to be a better person. I, I will agree with you on that. I will not deny that. But you're going to die and I'm going to die. And when I die and when you die, how is someone going to help me who could not conquer death? How is someone going to help me who was overpowered by the grave? I'm going into the realm of death. I am going into a grave of some form. And this world has a long history of great and influential religious and political and spiritual leaders who after their death were never heard from again. But this world had one man, one man, who after his death was seen alive by over 500 eyewitnesses at one time. And here he stands, talking with John and declaring, declaring, I am alive forevermore. Do you want to know that when your, your temporal life ends, when you breathe your last breath, your mortal body gives up the ghost, your remains are burned, your ashes are scattered, your remains are buried in some grand mausoleum or some lowly grave in the ground. Do you want to know that your soul will live forever? 
rather than suffer forever in the torments of hell. You say, I don't believe in hell. <laughs> Jesus said, and I have the keys of hell and of death. He took care of it all. We'll see that next time. But for now, for now, you need a Savior because you're going to die. You need a savior because when you die, you lack the power to get yourself out of the grave and live forever. And here's one who has that power. He manifested, he displayed it, he showed himself openly following his resurrection. And Jesus Christ has the power to give you everlasting life if you will believe on him, trust him, You've heard the word, turn from your belief or turn from your unbelief. Behold, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then fall at his feet and trust him as your Savior, and he will give you everlasting life. The Bible says it this way, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Thank you for watching. We'll pick up right here next time.